Thanks for having dinner with me, Bruce. I appreciate it. So, what do you want? So we're getting right down to business then. You always did want to play by the rules. Not rules. Right and wrong. While that may be true, I do have my orders. Orders? I have been tasked with reviewing three more of your action films. Can't let that happen. Sorry, Bruno, but I'm afraid you don't have a choice. Can't feel my eye. Think. Check, please. This is movie night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth reviews in five minutes or less. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. Action Movie Month enters its third week tonight as we take a look at Mr. Die Hard himself, actor and musician Bruce Willis. Believe it or not, we've already discussed nine of his films here on the show, but there's still a few more worth reviewing, so let's begin with Striking Distance. Although it failed to break even with its $30 million budget, this Rowdy Harrington action thriller from September of 1993 is much better than its box office receipts may indicate. Bruce Willis stars in the R-rated plot as a disgraced police officer forced to patrol Pittsburgh's Three Rivers with a rookie partner played in an early outing by Sarah Jessica Parker. Ousted from the force for ratting on fellow cops, Willis is eager to solve an ongoing serial murder case which inexplicably seems connected to his own life. Remarking on his string of bad fortune, he confides, All the women in my life keep turning up dead. Bruce is as good as can be expected with the confines of the story, but a romantic subplot involving Parker feels particularly forced and just plain gross. The police procedural seems to be a requisite for any action star, and while Willis has done his fair share of those movies, this lesser-known effort is surprisingly good. The 101-minute story opens with an incredible car chase up and over the hills of Pittsburgh, all filmed with long wide shots that frame the spectacular stunt work from the cast and crew. A shot where a hubcap breaks off and rolls towards a low-angle camera is a very cool moment and makes this police pursuit one of my all-time favorites. The supporting cast includes great turns from plenty of recognizable, if not quite A-list talent, from Dennis Farina, Tom Sizemore, Robert Pastorelli, Brian James, Timothy Busfeld, John Mahoney, and Andre Brauger. Of particular note is the late Farina, who basically built his entire career playing hard-nosed cops, and as expected, excels at this role here, playing a conservative police chief with a few secrets of his own. Striking Distance smartly plays into its limitations well. Even though our heroes are stuck patrolling the river, all the crimes involve their jurisdiction in a believable way, which allows for a great scene where Willis disables a car on a parallel roadway with boat flares. I'll blow his brains! This is a well-paced picture with a decently sharp script and a tense score from Brad Fidel. After a few unexpected plot developments late, the high-speed climax uses the formulaic elements of its genre to provide some really effective misdirection. When the camera narrows on the support column of a bridge, you totally expect the boat chase to reach its explosive finish at its base, but Harrington has something else in store. Although the underlying concept of a river patrolman is hardly interesting, the movie manages to delight with a few standout moments and a solid cast. Despite being cited as a very troubled production, this is one picture that action fans should definitely check out at least once. Striking Distance may seem familiar or boring, but it surprises with real excitement. I thought it was a good movie. For tonight's poll question, what's your favorite Bruce Willis film? Leave your response as a comment below. Next up, The Fifth Element. For better or worse, this film is the end result of throwing $90 million at French director Luc Besson and telling him to make an epic sci-fi adventure. And although it earned back almost three times that amount, it was the most expensive European film ever made when it was released in May of 1997. When I first saw this picture that summer at the Wares Beach Drive-In, I really had no idea what to make of this movie, but I was totally wowed by the visuals and scope, which spanned 300 years, two solar systems, and a host of interesting characters. Sometime in the 23rd century, when Earth is overpopulated to the tune of 200 billion individuals, life is threatened by evil incarnate. Bruce Willis stars as an ex-Special Forces major slash cab driver who unwittingly becomes allies with a sexy superweapon creature that is mankind's only defense against the planet killer. The totally bizarre 126-minute plot may have tongue 
tons of moving parts, but it flies along so fast you rarely have time to dwell on its plot holes or contrivances. Willis is his usual smart alecky self, confidently disarming bad guys with both his guns and intelligence. As the titular entity, 21-year-old Mila Jovovich is obviously stunning, but her playful curiosity and overall innocence makes her an extremely compelling and interesting character to root for. When Willis misjudges their relationship and goes in for an early kiss, the ensuing standoff is both cute and tense. Ian Holm is a wise but nervous priest, and Chris Tucker is a completely obnoxious radio host who wears some of the most bizarre costumes and hairstyles I've ever seen. Speaking of weird headgear, Gary Oldman is a fast-talking villain who has no problem killing his own customers. In a brazenly unique move, though, Willis and Oldman don't share a single scene together. Their characters remain oblivious to each other's involvement and are actually only on camera together for a single shot. Fortunately, the PG-13 rated picture remains decidedly entertaining without conforming to traditional conventions. The visual effects work by digital domain, especially during an early hover car chase through the congested skyways of future New York are impeccably done, and paint a vivid and realistic portrayal of the distant future. The anamorphic frame adeptly shows off the retro 60s costumes and fabulously inventive set designs as well. Later, a massive fight breaks out on board a stellar cruise, culminating with the largest indoor explosion ever filmed, which coincidentally is also totally awesome. Ah! Shut the hammer! Woo! I was so afraid I wasn't gonna make this flight, so I sent uh, David here. Yeah. to come and pick up my boarding pass. But, um, but and now uh, David has to go. Thank you. Bye. I am Corbin Dallas. And uh, this is? Lilu Dallas Multipass. Yeah. Multipass. Lila, uh, multipass. You know this multipass. Lilu Dallas, my wife. We're newlywed. Just met. Multipass. You know how it is. Bump into each other. Sparks multipass. happen. Yeah, she knows it's a multipass. Yeah, anyway, we're in love. Eric Serra's score mixes romantic strings and piano with some funkier beats, but a fistfight intercut with a live opera is edited particularly well. The film's climax overtly suggests that love conquers all, with Jovovich criticizing humanity's lust for war by admonishing, everything you create you use to destroy. Willis can only respond, yeah, we call it human nature. Despite its lasting cult appeal, this movie still has its share of flaws, from the convoluted plot to the almost nauseating amount of things happening on screen at any one time. But if you're able to look past all of that, and Tucker's annoying character, this is one adventure that will have you invested in its vibrant universe on multiple viewings. The Fifth Element is a colorful frenzy of unique ideas and tense action. And here's what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. Although many held off on the top score, you applauded this film's visuals and action, scoring it a great. And even though it does have issues, this is a memorable experience which I'll rate an 8 as well. Before we get to tonight's third review, a quick word on my Patreon campaign. While I've been extremely fortunate to pursue what I love for a living, AdSense CPM rates have declined dramatically over the years. So I'm humbly asking for your support to help maintain the quality and consistency of my videos well into the future. Instead of focusing on what sells, I can create fun content we're both passionate about, regardless of its revenue potential. So if you enjoy what I do, please visit patreon.com slash johnpaula to pledge a few dollars. Your donations will also unlock special perks like early access to my uploads and exclusive videos not featured anywhere else. A $5 pledge helps offset nearly 10,000 views on YouTube, so I greatly appreciate you even considering to help. Back to the reviews, let's discuss Red 2. Yet another follow-up that no one asked for, this action comedy film from director Dean Pariso somehow managed to gross $148 million when it was released on July 19th, 2013. Produced on a budget of $84 million, the PG-13 rated film reunites most of the cast of the 2010 original in an even more swollen and self-serving plot. We pick up the story three years later where retired CIA agent Bruce Willis and his weirdo friends are called back into action to track down a missing portable nuclear device hidden inside Russia. The 116 minute film has no carryover from the first installment, without so much of a mention about Ernest Borgnine or Morgan Freeman. The laboriously paced experience is convoluted and boring, often with repetitious dialogue. In fact, the exact same line of exposition is uttered twice in a three minute span. Besides the sloppily edited and uninspired action sequences, the main draw here is clearly the A-list cast led by Willis. Once a capable and charismatic action star, he's been reduced to a sarcastic and bulletproof caricature in recent years. When reminded that he hasn't killed anybody in months, Willis quickly retorts, That is not a bad thing, okay? That's a positive thing for a lot of people. At 50 years old, Mary Louise Parker is absolutely stunning, and definitely the picture's lone highlight in terms of comedic relief. But she's sadly given little to do, except make out with numerous ugly people. John Malkovich and Harry Muir in return with similar, if even more exaggerated, performances, but are also regulated to mugging for the camera and making dumb, inappropriately timed jokes. The force narrative literally spends the first hour introducing us to, and I'm not even joking here, 11 separate characters in one lame scene after another. 
Once the aforementioned core players are established, we also meet Neil McDonough, Catherine Zeta-Jones, David Thuas, Titus Welliver, Brian Cox, Lee Byung Hong, and Anthony Hopkins. McDonough is great as one of the picture's three bad guys, executing a military general with his bare hands while holding a normal conversation. But everyone else in this bloated cast of geriatrix is utterly wasted. By the time they're all introduced, there's only 40 minutes left to actually do anything, and by then it's far too late to unravel the messy story. The ragtag group of heroes globetrot around poorly utilized European locations in the blink of an eye, and with little purpose. Lee enjoys one of the more exciting action-oriented scenes when he takes out a store full of cops with a glass door still handcuffed to his wrist. But unbelievably, the Asian assassin is unable to kill some old guy collecting social security. What are you doing? Got him. Oh, what is she doing? I'm begging you. Yeah, 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 I got this. The minimalist and light-hearted score from accomplished composer Alan Silvestri sounds like a low-rent discotheque, but thankfully it isn't featured much. The widescreen cinematography manages to keep all the players in focus, but it's rather inconsistent, cutting away to disorienting wide shots and then back to stylized close-ups that feel so out of place. Between the infrequently used scene transitions that remind us that yes, this was originally an adaptation of a comic book, the visual effects and bloodless gunplay are rarely realistic. Although it's never stylized as one, the title is an acronym for Retired Extremely Dangerous, but this tepid experience is anything but dangerous and should never have come out of retirement. Red 2 has a detrimentally undernourished cast with awful action, and here's what you had to say about it. Far less harsh than I was, you criticized the unoriginal story but still had fun here, scoring this a 5 out of 10. With this group of people, a movie this unenjoyable and disjointed is inexcusable. I thought it was bad. Finally tonight, let's see what you're saying about films currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. Next week, we'll be reviewing Keanu Reeves' movies, the bank-robbing surfer film Point Break, 1996's Chain Reaction, and his latest action film John Wick, which is new on DVD this week. Once you've seen these films, share your opinions by voting in the polls below or by leaving a comment review. If you'd like to watch more Movie Night videos, check out the related reviews on the right, or click subscribe to be notified of all future uploads. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.